the picture you are now looking at is complete in every detail, with the exception of one element, illumination. But television lighting must do more than illuminate. It must model a performer's features, mold the patterns of a set, create the illusion of spatial separation and depth, and in short, help convince the viewer of the reality of the image illusion. In fact, lighting is one of the most powerful creative tools we have. Properly used, it can set and maintain moods, heighten the impact of dramatic scenes, and give rise to a whole range of theater of the mind effects. It can, for example, turn daytime into night, light a fireplace, turn the set into a city apartment, and locate it next to a theater's flashing sign. And by adding sound effects, create a storm. But artistic lighting does not happen by accident. It is achieved through the creative application of fundamental principles as a blend of art and science. To begin with, the television system is an imaging system which creates images of objects or scenes in reality. However, it is not a perfect system, as in fact no imaging system is, and thus the conversion is not effected without some compromise. The system is limited in resolving capacity, has a rather high noise figure producing an all too noticeable grain structure over the picture, is unable to handle a wide range of scenic contrasts, unable to perceive spatial separations and depth in a scene, and in many cases like this one, also monochromatic. The two of these limitations which most directly affect the lighting requirements are the system's inability to handle a wide range of scenic contrasts and to perceive depth separation. We can demonstrate the first of these, that of contrast limitation, with this gray block. If we observe the light meter scale and the electronic waveform while we increase the light, we can see that the block on stage gets brighter as shown by the increasing light meter reading. The image on the screen gets brighter and the voltage on the waveform rises. This continues until the block on stage gets so bright that the system can no longer recognize the higher white brightness. Of course, the block on stage continues to get brighter as the meter shows, but the picture on the screen does not and the waveform level ceases to rise. Regardless of the brightness of the block on stage, the picture will get no whiter. In fact, if we continue to increase the light on the block, we begin to cause severe image distortions in the form of halos and ghosts around the block. Thus, if the camera is pointed at a scene with excessive contrast, the system will fail to reproduce it faithfully and will distort those tone values whose brightnesses differ by more than about 40 to 1. In fact, 20 to 1 is probably a more practical figure. This limitation forces us to restrict the contrast of television scenic elements and their lighting, and to carefully control the balance of that lighting to fit this restricted contrast range. Secondly, the system's inability to perceive depth in a scene can be demonstrated by observing this row of small columns. From the front, the camera is unable to tell that they are not in the same plane. This limitation forces us to resort to the use of lighting effects to emphasize spatial separations and depth in a scene. Thus, television scenes, costumes, and their lighting must be tailored to produce a believable image. This tailoring must be done not to suit the human eye on stage, but to satisfy the eye of the camera. Doing this without compromising the artistic quality of the final result is the trick of the lighting trade. To help understand this trick, it'll be useful to understand some fundamentals about light and lighting instruments. Light is a form of energy, like radio waves, but of much shorter wavelength. In a uniform medium, it travels in straight lines, and its passage through space creates no visible sensation until the ray is intercepted and a portion of it reflected into the camera lens. When a ray like this is intercepted, several different effects may occur, either singly or in combination. First, if the light is intercepted with a black object with a rough surface, like this black velvet, practically all of the light is absorbed and very little is reflected. If the ray is intercepted with a flat, highly polished surface, like this mirror, most of the light is reflected in a single direction at an angle equal and opposite to the angle of incidence. Very little light is absorbed. This type of reflection is called regular or specular reflection. 
finally, if the ray is intercepted with a light object with a rough surface like this white matte card, most of the light is again reflected, but this time it's reflected in all directions. Very little is transmitted or absorbed. This type of reflection is called diffuse reflection. In practical television settings, both types of reflection occur. Specular reflections are the bright directional reflections off of jewelry, shiny objects, glassware, and so on, while diffuse reflections are those off most other scenic elements. Perfectly diffuse reflections, like those off this card, have an interesting property. They appear equally bright from all viewing directions. We can demonstrate this effect by observing this white card and its electronic waveform as the camera moves from this direct frontal shot around to an extreme angular shot. As can be seen, the brightness of the card appears unchanged. Now, most television settings and costumes are also diffuse reflectors and therefore also exhibit this property and appear equally bright from multiple camera angles. Now, the character of the light source and its direction greatly influence the appearance of the illuminated object. The lighting instruments used in television, therefore, employ different lens and reflector configurations to direct and control the light rays. Some instruments provide diffuse or soft light, and others varying degrees of specular or hard light. A few typical television lighting instruments are shown in this display. This group of lights is commonly used to provide a soft, almost shadowless diffuse fill or base light. This one is a scoop. And as you can see, the shadow pattern is not sharply defined. These lights are spotlights with Fresnel lenses. They project a more specular light beam, forming a relatively sharp shadow pattern on the background. Lamps of this type are used as key, modeling, back, or cross-fill lights. These spotlights are fitted with Plano convex lenses. They throw a sharp beam and form sharp shadow patterns. The narrow beam makes them ideal as follow spots, tight keys, or pattern projectors. Once combined on stage, these tools, properly used, aid in achieving the three basic goals of good lighting. These goals are, first, to provide sufficient balanced lighting of restricted contrast, second, to provide artistic modeling for performers and settings, and third, to provide light to fit the mood or intent of the scene. In regard to the first of these, it's important to remember that lighting cannot be treated independently. The scenic elements, their reflectance, the light on them, and the camera exposure are intrinsically interrelated. An error in any one can damage the result. When the scenery and lighting are combined on stage, the camera sees the product of the two. That is, the reflectance of the scenic elements and the light on them. In fact, these two factors are so interchangeable that the final tonal value for any individual element can be altered by either altering the tone of the element itself or the light on it. A setting like these blocks, for example, under conditions of flat light, produces a black block, a dark gray block, a light gray block, and a white block. If we turn out this light and replace it with individual lights, each focused on a separate block and adjusted to a particular intensity, we can make all the blocks appear to be the same or very nearly the same gray tone. And we have effectively painted them with light. In a practical set, it's not always possible to separate each scenic element and paint it with light, as we've done in this demonstration. Thus, scenic elements of excessive contrast, which are permitted even accidentally to show up in a scene, contribute nothing to the final result, but can cause a lot of trouble. In this scene, the camera has been exposed for proper flesh tones, thereby overexposing the white shirt. Since the white shirt doesn't contain much detail, the overexposure in this case doesn't particularly damage the picture. However, it injects useless but high-level information into the waveform presentation. Misinterpretation of this waveform information can result in improper camera exposure. To illustrate what can happen, we will insert a waveform of this scene so arranged that it will display a single line of picture information at a time. The thin white line in the picture indicates which line is being displayed on the waveform. As you can see, the shirt is at the reference white level, while the flesh tones are where they belong in the light gray area. If we look at the shirt again and lower the camera exposure, we can see that the overexposed shirt stays at the reference white level, 
until the camera exposure has been reduced by two f-stops. At this exposure, the shirt is still white, but the flesh tones are much too dark. A slightly darker shirt would reproduce as white without altering the flesh tones. All scenic elements of excessive contrast can cause exposure confusion, but they are most dangerous when they're closely related to other scenic elements and cannot be separately lit. As far as the absolute level of light is concerned, it's relatively unimportant as long as the light is balanced within the proper contrast range. The level is more a function of the sensitivity of the camera pickup tube in use and of the lens iris opening. Typical four and a half inch image orthicon cameras seldom require more than 60 or 70 foot candles of light to provide a suitable depth of field for most scenes. Now, lighting within the right contrast range is still not enough. Television lighting has a second job to do. It must create a three-dimensional appearance to an otherwise flat television picture. To do this, objects must be modeled with light from various angles. This emphasizes their shapes by forming shadow patterns and shadings of light. To demonstrate this, we'll begin with a simple object. With only the background illuminated, about all you can tell about the object is that it's opaque and in front of the light. Otherwise, it has no three-dimensional appearance. If a light is now added to its front face, it begins to assume a shape. By adding a light on the other side, it begins to appear three-dimensional. Another light coming from the top rear completes the image. As you can see, the intensity of these lights is not the same. The intensity of the top or back light is slightly greater than that of the key light, which in turn is slightly greater than that of the fill light. The angle and intensity relationships we have used here illustrate those used to light almost any three-dimensional object. We can demonstrate this by applying the same lighting approach to a human face. The key light produces shadows which emphasize the three-dimensional form of the face. The fill light softens those shadows to the desired amount. And the backlight adds light to the top and shoulders of the model to help separate her from the background. Now the lighting angles and elevations used in this scene are shown on this chart. The key light is here, the fill light here, and the backlight here. The location of this key light is all important because it establishes the shadow pattern on the face. If it's poorly located, off to the far side, for example, the result is less than flattering. Similarly, if it's located too close and too high, another unflattering image may result. Again, if it's located too low, the result is poor. Television programs are seldom as simple as these single subjects. In a more complicated setting, the job becomes difficult because there are many combinations of these basic lighting setups, and the lighting must also take into account the action in the scene and the multiple shooting angles of the cameras. A setting like this is typical of many interview settings and is yet simple enough to illustrate the basic on-stage lighting problems. The key lights in this set can be located here and here, with the fill light here. Separate backlights can be used here and here. The brightness of the background can be controlled by putting set lights here. And since the scene has been wisely staged with separation between the actors and the background, light from the set lights will not spill on the performers. A separate key, fill, and backlight setup can be used for the rise and cross to the chart. Let's look at the on-stage results. As the girl rises and goes to the chart, she is properly lit and well modeled at the chart. If we replace this curtain with a rear projection screen, we can demonstrate another familiar lighting problem. As you can see, the rear projection scene is out of balance with the foreground and appears dark. They must be brought into balance for proper camera exposure. Either the brightness of the rear screen projector can be raised like this, or if it's at its maximum point and still lacks brightness like this, then the foreground lighting intensity must be lowered proportionately and the camera exposure increased to compensate for the lower light level. Lighting balance like this must be maintained 
to keep each scenic element at its proper exposure level to produce the desired tonal renditions. Without a great deal of experience, this is difficult, if not impossible, to do by eye, and sometimes too late to do on camera. For this reason, a light meter is a useful tool to aid in achieving balance within a scene and in maintaining it between different scenes. Light meters like this measure the incident light on a scene and are convenient to use. However, they require a calculation to relate their reading to the reflectance value of the scenic elements to know the amount of light returned to the camera. A meter like this spot photometer measures the luminance of the scenic elements directly and sees the scene as the camera does. With a meter like this, a scene can be scanned to quickly establish lighting balance. The luminance of flesh tones and other scenic elements can be checked and related to one another to control the contrast range of the whole scene. Finally, artistic lighting has a third requirement to fulfill. It must come from believable angles and from believable sources in a scene. But within the limitations of the imaging process, television lighting is basically a creative activity and any given scene might be interpreted differently by different people. This scene was interpreted by one lighting director. Here's another interpretation of the same scene. To further demonstrate the range of artistic effects that can be achieved with well-modeled, balanced, motivated light, we're going to look at some more scenes. This interior setting has been lit with flat light. To light it properly, let's begin by setting the background lighting. If we assume that it's daytime in the room, sunlight should be streaming through the window and the outdoor backdrop would be brightly lit. Windows, which we can suppose to be on the camera side of the set, would also contribute light and shadow to the pattern in the, in the room. As you can see, the lamps simulating sunlight are set at relatively high angles, so much of their light strikes the floor, as is the case in normal rooms. Thus, the floors are lighter than the vertical surfaces in the room. Compare this to the shadowless pattern created by the flat lighting. The performers in a scene must be separately modeled and lit for every position of action. Their key lights, too, must be located with some degree of logic to fit the basic motivation of the scene. The light source keen an actor, for example, would normally not appear to come from a dark corner of the room. The intensity of these lights must, of course, balance with the other lights in the set. This exterior has been balanced to simulate a high-key sunlit exterior. The shadow pattern cast by the tree leaves helps heighten this outdoor effect. The open sandy area is also lit to simulate sunlight. The waveform of this high key scene shows most of the information in the high mid gray to white areas, but there are smaller details in the black region. By changing the distribution of the light in this scene, we can simulate a low-key moonlight effect.
This mood is created by dropping the illumination in the areas surrounding the important action and by increasing the sharpness and depth of shadow detail on the performers. However, the level of illumination used in the key light areas is unchanged. The waveform shows the effects of this rebalance. Most of the information falls between the mid-gray and black regions, yet the highlights are still up in the white region. In the interior scene, the effect of darkness is created through the use of practical lamps and the theater of the mind suggestion that the scene outside is darker than the inside. Since sunlight is not present, the high angle lights are not used and the floor is not as bright as it was before. The waveform of this scene shows a full distribution of black to white tones. All these scenes use the same level of light in the key light areas. Only the distribution and direction of the light was modified to obtain the effects. Good television lighting can enhance an entire production, but it can only be achieved through the creative application of sound technical principles. Contrasts must be restricted to fit the system's limited brightness range. Balance must be maintained to produce consistent tonal renditions. Modeling must create a feeling of depth and spatial separation. And the overall effect must fit the mood or intent of the scene. Lighting for television presents a huge range for artistic expression. The principles are simple. Translating these principles into an infinity of artistic illusions should be a continuing challenge. <laughs>